you are clear for launch. And with that, shut down your visors. O2 on and prepare for ignition to O2. Copy that and um And we're back. Hi, I'm Mr. Rushoff, and in this lesson, we're going to look at how the geography of Africa has impacted the history of Sub-Saharan Africa and how that history has helped shape the culture of Sub-Saharan Africa we have today. And when we start at the beginning, the beginning in Africa tends to be much earlier than the other regions of the world. This is because when we're talking about humans, it all starts in Africa, as the continent is known as the cradle of the human species. The oldest human remains, such as these two skulls here, dating over 250,000 years ago, are found in Africa, as well as all the other ancestors of our race, some which go back some two and a half to three million years. In fact, we could actually say that we are all Africans. This is because the prevailing theory is that the human race developed in Africa, and then around 130 to 170,000 years ago, we began to cross over the Sinai Peninsula and the Bab al Medeb, and then spread throughout the world. Of course, not everyone left. This means that for well over 200,000 years, modern humans have lived on the continent. It is this long occupation of the land and the numerous physical obstacles dividing the different groups in Africa that has made the continent the most diverse continent in the world. Anthropologists don't quite agree on the number of ethnic groups in Africa, but the number is over 3,000 different groups, speaking over 2,100 different languages and dialects. Now, what many don't realize is that Africa was home to many large and powerful civilizations and kingdoms. In Northern Africa, we have already talked about the ancient Egyptians, but in Sub-Saharan Africa, there were many other civilizations as well. Now, while there are a few kingdoms, such as the Congo and the Zimbabwe, who were found south of the Congo rainforest, most of these powerful kingdoms were found to the north of the Congo. Three of these we find centered on the Niger River, which is the Ghana, the Mali, and the Songhai. These kingdoms followed each other, one growing larger than the last. Now, what brought these kingdoms power was the trade of salt, gold, and then later slaves. Now, during the time of these kingdoms, both gold and salt were arguably the most valuable commodities in the world, and these kingdoms controlled the mines that produced both. Another advantage that these kingdoms had was their relationship with the nomadic Berber tribes of the Sahara. Each of these kingdoms were able to use the Berbers to guide camel caravans across the Sahara, where they would be able to trade with Mediterranean merchants. Now, being the emperor of one of these kingdoms was certainly profitable. In fact, one Mali emperor is often described as the richest man in history. This is Mansa Musa, who ruled the Mali Empire for 25 years. During this time, he was able to capitalize on this trade of gold and salt. In fact, on the Catalan map, a map that is considered the most important map produced in the Middle Ages, Mansa Musa is depicted holding a golden nugget. An example of his great wealth was shown during his pilgrimage to Mecca. Along for the ride was 60,000 men, each carrying four pounds of gold. 80 camels also were brought along, each carrying anywhere between 50 and 300 pounds of gold. With all this gold, Mansa Musa is recorded to have paid to build a mosque every Friday during his trip. So perhaps a good question is, what happened to all these super rich, powerful civilizations? Why is it when we look at Africa today, we find a continent of poverty, not overwhelming riches? Well, there are several reasons for this. And we've already seen by Africa's physical geography creates problems for transportation of trade. Deserts, rainforests, escarpments, cataracts all become obstacles to travel. But in Central Africa, there is another problem that began to limit development, and that is the lack of large domesticated animals. Domestication, remember, means that mankind can establish permanent control over animals such as horses, cows, sheep, and pigs. Unfortunately, there are few large domesticated animals in Africa. Now, there are large animals in Africa, but because there are so many predators that they have to always defend against, these animals are naturally very scared, they will flee away, and they really make very poor domesticated animals. Now, remember, the Americas had the same problem too until the Europeans brought over cows, horses, and sheep, and other domesticated animals. But here, Africa has another problem, disease. Enter the tsetse fly. When European domesticated animals were introduced, they would be bit by the tsetse fly, get sick, and die. This is because the tsetse fly dominates Central Africa and carries a disease known as the sleeping sickness. So Africa finds itself with large animals that could not be tamed, as well as imported animals that did not have the immunity in order to survive. Now, without domesticated animals, African civilizations lag behind other civilizations in the world in terms of long-term growth. 
But what really wrecked Africa is slavery. Now, we often talk about the effects of slavery in the United States and the Americas, but we often forget the devastating effect that slavery had on Africa itself. First of all, we need to realize that slavery in Africa dated back thousands of years before European powers ever came to the continent. But it was the Europeans, largely the Portuguese, who put slavery into hyperdrive. Once the New World discovered, the death due to disease of the American natives created a problem for Portugal and Spain. This was the need for labor. As the Treaty of Tordesillas had granted Portugal control of all the new lands found east of the line of demarcation, these lands included the coastline of Western Africa. Therefore, the Portuguese established trade routes along the western coast of Africa and began doing trade with the African tribes such as the Asante and the Oheme, who would go into the interior of Africa, capture other Africans, and then deliver them to the Portuguese on the coast who would bring them to the New World as slaves. This is the reason why far more Africans were enslaved in Portuguese Brazil than anywhere else. Surprisingly, only a very small percentage of Africans actually were brought to North America. Now, other European powers became involved, including the British, and soon we had the Atlantic slave trade, also known as the Triangle Slave Trade. The African Asante and Duhemi tribes wanted to get guns to be able to capture more Africans and defend their empire, and they wanted alcohol. So the Europeans would trade them guns and alcohol for captured Africans. The Africans would be brought to the New World, where they would be traded for cash crops such as sugar, cotton, tobacco. And then these cash crops would be brought back to Europe, where they would be traded for guns and alcohol to be traded for the Asante and Dohemi tribes for even more Africans. This triangle slave trade created the vicious cycle in which each cycle brought more and more people out of Africa. Once a product of war, slavery became the reason for war in Africa between these different African tribes. And in the 400 years of this Atlantic slave trade, over 12 million Africans were removed from the continent, and that was just due to the Atlantic slave trade. From slave markets such as the eastern island Zanzibar, another 40,000 Africans were captured and brought to the Arabian Peninsula each year as slaves. This left huge holes in the population in Africa. Additionally, when the slave trade was finally illegalized, empires that had built their wealth upon these slaveries no longer had a source of income, and we see even these empires collapse. Slavery largely destroyed Africa. With Africa so weak, this left them vulnerable to European conquest. But European colonization didn't happened right away. For centuries, there was almost no direct contact between Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa. Europeans did not know how to navigate across the Sahara Desert successfully, and before the 1400s, they did not have the naval technology in order to sail to the region. This happened in the 1400s and the age of exploration, as the Portuguese began setting off for a sea route to the riches of Asia. But even then, the Europeans would still only stay along the coast to be able to trade with Africans, as they would not venture into the interior of Central Africa. Now, there are three major reasons for this. First of all, Africa has few natural harbors, which complicates the anchoring a ship and launching an exploration onto the land. Second is sailing up many of these rivers were blocked by waterfalls or cataracts, but the biggest problem was malaria. African mosquitoes carried the disease of malaria, which Europeans did not have any immunity from, nor did they understand how to protect themselves like the Africans did. Central Africa earned the name the White Man's Grave. This changed in the 1850s when the large-scale extraction of the active agent of the South American quinine plant was made possible. Quinine, often used as a flavoring agent in tonic water, gave Europeans a treatment for malaria. With quinine, Europeans could begin moving into the interior of Central Africa. The first Europeans to start moving into Africa's interior were the missionaries and explorers. And as late as the 1800s, we find that Africa was still largely being ruled by Africans. But that was about to change. Europeans eyed Africa as the last land to be colonized. It was the last domain to explore, convert Christianity, and more importantly, to find wealth in its resources, such as rubber plants. Now, with nearly all colonies, the Europeans wanted to establish commercial agriculture in which cash crops, such as cotton and rubber, would be brought back to Europe to sell at a high price. An added benefit was that the Europeans could use the Africans to do the work for low wages. However, the rush for European colonization in other areas had led to war between these European states. So in an effort to avoid this in Africa, in 1884, the European countries met in Berlin, Germany, to divide Africa amongst themselves. This was the Berlin Conference. Of course, who was not around the table in Berlin were the Africans. And the Africans were largely unable to stop Europeans from conquering the continent. Now, a notable exception to this is Ethiopia. Now, while Italy was promised Ethiopia during the Berlin Conference, the Ethiopians themselves were able to use the advantage of the Ethiopian highlands to defeat the Italian forces. 
Now, although occupied for five years, Ethiopia can claim to be the only country in Africa that was never colonized by a European country. Unfortunately for the rest of Africa, they were dominated by Europe, divided into two countries with borders drawn by Europeans with no regards to tribal and ethnic distributions. These boundaries create problems that exist up to today. Now, there were positives to European colonization. The Europeans built infrastructure, bettered healthcare, increased agricultural production, and provided educational opportunities that had not existed in Africa before. But they brought some pretty serious negatives beyond the loss of control and disregard for ethnicity. These other negatives included the loss of traditional culture, forced labor and human rights abuses, and forcing Africans to abandon their subsistence agriculture to adopt commercial agriculture. This meant that cash crops became more important than food or staple crops. This made Africans far more susceptible to famines. Now, after World War II, we begin to see the beginning of the end of European colonies around the world, and that includes Africa. Now, between 1950 and 1980, most European countries became independent countries. But even with independence, things really didn't get much better for the African people. The cash crop economies that worked well for Europe did not work for the newly independent African countries. Most Africans had to resort back to subsistence agriculture just to be able to survive, leaving little income for these new governments. Additionally, the European-drawn borders started to create violent problems within Africa. Now, under colonization, the Europeans tried to play one tribe against the other as a method of control. They would take one tribe or ethnic group and give them special treatment and control over all the other ethnic groups in that country. This made the control of the colony much easier for the European ruler. Now, when these African countries became independent, it was this ruling tribe that usually became the only power in charge in what we call one-party rule. This set the conditions for future conflict. Two examples are Sudan and Rwanda. In Sudan, we saw differences between the Muslim herders in the north and the Christian and animist farmers in the south. These groups were combined into one country under the British before the land became independent. And in 2011, we see the country once again split into two by a civil war, and now we have a Sudan and a South Sudan. Now, in Rwanda, we see that after independence, disagreements between two ethnic groups, the Hutus and Tutsis, broke out into violence. The Tutsis left Rwanda, but in 1990, many returned to attack and gain power in the country. The conflict evolved in 1994 in the Rwandan genocide, in which over 500,000 Tutsis were killed by the Hutus in a period of about 30 days. And if you do the math, you realize that this is an average of nearly 12 people killed every minute for 30 days and mostly killed by machete. Another issue that countries like South Africa continues to face is racism. While South Africa gained its independence from Britain in 1931, in 1948, the Afrikaner Nationalist Party came to power and established apartheid, which was the legal separation of the races. This racist policy continued even after international pressure and sanctions mounted during the 1980s in an attempt to force the white South African government to end apartheid. Then in 1990, F.W. de Klerk made the decision to release the anti-apartheid leader Nelson Mandela from prison, and then he abolished apartheid in 1991. Four years later, Nelson Mandela was elected as South Africa's first black president, and in 1996, the country's constitution was changed to guarantee equal rights for all of its citizens. All right, so these were some of the historical events that were shaped by geography and have further continued to shape the cultures of Africa. So until next time... Keep on learning.